Two weeks ago, I'm outside my office. My assistant comes up and says, Suge Knight wants to speak to you from jail. I said, who? He said, Suge Knight. The Suge? Yes. Got to be kidding me. No. Get on the phone. We have a great conversation together. He says, hey, I watched the podcast. I want to come on and do the longest podcast and speak to you about any questions you may have about Diddy, Jay-Z, Biggie, Tupac, what's going on with music industry, et cetera, et cetera. So then yesterday... We have the podcast that we do. He calls in six times. Each call is 15 minutes. We have to edit it because he is calling from prison. And we had a great conversation together. The things he said to me about Diddy was very interesting. He says, do you think Diddy independently picked up these habits or do you think somebody taught him? And who taught him? He dropped two names of who he claims that taught Diddy these bad habits of what to do with boys. And he says Usher can stop it because there's something that he... And then he brought in, you know, we talked Tupac, how the difference between him losing Tupac that cost him money versus the difference between Diddy losing Biggie, it made him money. And the feud and the stuff with Dre at the end when Dre was going to get 50%, $60 million, how that whole arrangement worked out and how the negotiation with Eazy-E, what he said about Eazy-E's feud with Dre that I had never heard before. Anyways, if you're somebody that follows hip-hop, you know the whole story because a couple of weeks ago, I had Dame Dash on. So that was a whole different conversation that we had. If you're somebody that follows these things closely, I had Greg Kading in the past before telling me exactly who shot Tupac Biggie because I'm curious, the detective that did the background on this. You're going to be glued to the phone to hear what Shook has to say. Uh, because when Shook answers, sometimes he goes like this. And you just kind of have to hear what he's trying to connect the dots. But if you speak... That language, you'll kind of know what Suge is saying. And there was a couple parts that he he's, he could be a comedian. But with that being said, here's Suge Knight on PBD Podcast. All right, so we have a uh, special guest here with us today. Suge Knight from R.J. Donovan Correctional <laughs> Facility, uh, prison in San Diego. Uh, Suge, uh, uh, for those of you that obviously follow hip-hop, his background, founder, co-founder of... Uh, Death Row Records at one point seven hundred and fifty million dollars of generated revenue. I think one year they sold sixty million records, one hundred fifty million total records sold. They had some of the biggest albums ever, signing Easy, Snoop, Dre, Tupac, Nate Dogg, Corrupt, MC Hammer, Warren G. The list goes on. Uh, Shook, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Hey, great being on here, and I appreciate that. By the way, you know one of the things I think it's important for the audience to know is the fact that you just said, look. Whatever Pat wants to ask, I want to have all the conversations, any questions, nothing's off the table. Is that, is that correct? I like Pat. And one of the things that I always feel, if you ever going to do something and have a platform, it's about telling your truth to the next person's truth to help the generation. I agree. By the way, Shook, did you by any chance, before we get started, did you ever have a chance to watch the Cat Williams podcast with Shay Shay with Shannon Sharp? Did you watch the whole thing? Well, number one... You know, that's family. But at the same time, no, nah, I'm in the penitentiary to watch that. But I heard about it like the whole world did. I heard it was a great interview. Now, let me ask you, Shug, your experience with Cat. If you were, if for the audience, you and Cat have hung out, who is Cat to you? Is he a stand up guy, good friend, relationship guy that you could trust? Oh, I can trust him. Okay. And I don't say that about too many people, but at the same time, you know, Cat is who he is. And if you really want to understand Cat, he on tour right now. Go buy one of the tickets for a road. He won't hear it all. He's going to tell the truth. So that's the best way to find out about track. <laughs> Even from there, you're selling tickets. You can't, no matter where you're, you're, you're selling. No, the only reason I ask this question is because when he did this interview with Shannon Sharp, uh, and I know you played in the NFL before, when he did this interview with Shannon Sharp, Everywhere, everybody was talking, but also people were quiet. I want to play one of the clips, Rob. If you can play the clip of what uh, Kat said to Shannon Sharp about Diddy, I just want you to hear this since you haven't heard the whole thing. This is just a snippet of what Kat said about Diddy. Go for it. Uh, big di- big dance is it. all Can't catching see. hell in 2024. It's up for all of them. It don't matter if you Diddy or whoever you is. TG Jakes, any of them. The, all, every, all lies will be exposed. That's all. And, and, and anyone who takes that the wrong way <clears throat> know why they take it the wrong way. Now, when, when this came out, he went after, you know, uh, uh, Diddy. He went after TDJ. He went after a lot of people in the space. Had you 
Kat and Diddy, had, did you guys ever party together, three of you guys? I know you and Diddy spent some time together, but did you, Kat, and Diddy ever hey, spend hey, time together? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say I never had a threesome. I uh, damn sure ain't had no threesome with no men. So you tell me I have me and... No, that's and not what I'm asking. Three of them out together. What you trying to do? <laughs> I mean, have you said, not me. Well, th listen, that is becoming an every day something new pops up where it's no longer a surprise now. <clears throat> but I guess the question I'm asking is, did, did you, did you, no, Kat, and, did you, Diddy and Kat ever, ever hang out where, and the reason why I'm asking this, where you actually personally witnessed some of the accusations that Diddy is having, saying no, the fact no, that he had cameras no, in the this room. This is, this, okay. But this is the thing I'm going to tell you. We from two different worlds, number one, him and I. Number two, I'm the guy they didn't want to invite to those parties. And I'm glad of it. I've never been that would be left out in my life. But at the same time, um, I'm not the guy who's in for puffy downfall. But I'm, I am the guy who supports the victims who got victimized, right? But at the same time, whatever the situation is, everybody knows it's wrong. And I don't think he can get uh, punished as hard as a regular person because, you know, he used to be an FBI informant for a long time, they say. So I'm quite sure that play a role. You're, you're saying? I'm asking the question, me, Chad, and Puffy. We had no reason to be hanging out. Me and Cam and not me and Puffy. So that's that. Got it. So you're saying Diddy what Diddy's an FBI informant and he's been one for many years. How would they say nothing never happens, but it's still like I said, I ain't the, it ain't my business when I said that because anybody else got for the quick, fast and a hurry. But you know, the most important thing about this is that with me, you got some people or have a pin on something that either they weren't a part of or they weren't there. And I never want to be that type of person because you know, it's only so many people who was uh, who had Tupac or seen Tupac or talked to Tupac. And I feel that way because I often hear so many Tupac stories uh, from people who never met him, people who wasn't around. Then you had a one that if they worked at McDonald's and they took Tupac orders, they don't mean they know Tupac mm. or you do a security or whatever. They don't mean you know the man. All these people have been uh, benefiting and capitalizing on trying to put the man down or lie on them or tell some stories that they weren't there or they know anything about. Because I don't think none of these people are psychic. And I'm not. You know what happened to the last psychic big bitch? She ended up, whoever her name was, the fake with the fake Boston boys. You know what happened to her? It all went bad. So I don't. I don't like to speculate, so I just tell the truth how it is. Now, from from your perspective, though, you you actually spend time with Diddy when you used to go to New York. You guys would you would spend time with him, and he would spend time with you when he would come. You guys would go hang out together with uh, obviously other peers. Did you notice anything around Diddy where you said this is a little bit? You know, obviously there's a woman. You're having a good time. You're partying. You're doing your thing. But did you ever see anything where it was? Out of line where you said, I think this guy likes men, or I think he likes certain things that's a little weird. Well, well all due respect to Puffy, you got to realize one thing. He didn't start off like that. I'm quite sure somebody taught him that, and that's more got deep it. in the industry. You guys who got involved with a lot of people who they mentors, instead of having a guy to mentor your own father, they was having these guys they mentor. And when that happens in the industry, they, it was done to them. They do to the next person. So I felt that Puffy was a regular, normal guy. And then when he started hanging with the guys in the industry, they did things to him. And then allegedly, he did things to Usher. It goes on and on. But we got to stop this pointing the finger at the person who gets caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Where did it start from? But see, if people don't want to touch on those angles that they started being the major uh, executives who run these labels. So you guys want to speak on the people who got thrown on the bus to sacrifice lamb. Okay. Well, that's actually very insightful for you to give that perspective. So if you're saying what did he did to Usher or what did he do to Bieber, that we've seen these videos, not necessarily what he did, but the stories where he's living with them at 13, 
if he was their mentor, who was Diddy's mentor? We know some of the big names. I'm just curious if you have any names. You don't seem like uh, somebody. Uh, well, well for number, number one was Clyde Davis. And you got to understand one thing. If Death Row, when I started Death Row, you got to remember one thing. I didn't have no co founder and nobody else. So I started that company on my own and grabbed Dr. Dre. At the end of the day, it was like this. When you have, uh, say, Universal is one big company. Doug Morris is the man at the time. Jimmy Iveen's in. If Doug Morris gives Tuffy a deal worth a whole lot of money and the album's been recouped, otherwise basically like flop been recouped, they're not going to give you no new money if they don't recoup the old money. But if Puffy was able to go to the same umbrella and go to Jimmy and get just much a check, uh, uh, even bigger check that Doug gave him, even though it have not recouped. Only certain people who get the, can get these type of favors. Now, in my situation, I didn't do anything to lose my company. I didn't think, do anything illegal to get my company taken away from me. They was able to commit it fraud for my company, but it ends up to the hands of people who wanted to buy my company for five hundred million, seven hundred million. I kept saying no, and then turn around, they can get uh, block everybody and end up getting it for what twenty or thirty million, which is crazy. If you add all that type of stuff up, and you'll see how the, in the industry been built on the secret rooms, the people who don't participate in the secret room. It's the people who later on get burnt. The people who participate in those room, rooms, they, can't, they, can, they continue to grow. And even when they get caught, they're not really caught. Because obviously, Buffy knew they was coming to the raid. The security wasn't there. He used to have like four, six Muslim guys uh, doing security. They weren't there. A lot of people weren't there. How do people know all these things? It wasn't just a coincidence. You know? So it's easy to point the finger, but let's look at the whole thing and talk about somewhere you're going to educate everybody to help everybody. We were talking about Clive Davis and some of these music executives that taught maybe somebody like a Diddy and others. Is Diddy at a level of being untouchable where he's protected, or is Diddy a target that they'll eventually put all the blame on him and make sure they get away with it free? I mean... He's definitely going to be the black motherfucker holding the bag. <laughs> you got you to gotta realize one thing. That boy's life is dangerous. His life is in, and he's just not dangerous with the shit they said he was doing, but he's in danger. He know too much. One thing you got to realize is you, he probably having a conversation right now with the higher-ups and everybody else to figure out how it's going to work itself out. Because he know all the secrets, and if he get to run in his mouth, it could be a it could be a bad look. I look at it like the most important thing is the industry need to be built over. You have all these executives because somebody was their father, their grandfather, or all these type of stuff, and they don't give people the opportunity to grow and learn. I know when I first started in this business, it wasn't a machine. I had to be the machine. I had to figure out how to get my songs on the radio because at that time they was getting five percent and they got ten percent. It was popping champagne bottles. I went from um, ninety-five percent of the songs you hear on the radio was my songs into ninety-seven percent. So you had to really do all this thing and really do the work. And once the work was known that it could be done, and I was generating the type of money for the people I was involved. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. They wanted to be hip hop because the difference was that Michael Jackson was being, say, 75 million, 50 million before he sold one record. They gave him 75 to 50 million dollars advance. He might spend 50 million dollars, or he might spend 100 million dollars to make his album, and 5 million dollars on the video. I was spending 50 thousand dollars to make an album. Mm. I was spending 50 thousand on the video. Mm -hmm. I was spending 150 thousand to promote it. So, and if I sell 3 million records, and Michael Jackson said 3 million records, or if he sell 10 million records, 
I would rather make more money That's right. off my projects than his projects because I'm spending less money. Right. Because I was the machine. So once they realized I was the machine and they can have a machine like that, the majors wanted what I started and wanted my artists. But when they took my artists and they got control of the industry, everything went from fifty thousand fifty thousand dollars to make an album to fucking five million to make an album until these guys having all these dancers and all these extra shit, all the surgeries and all the extra shit, right? So in the end, they blew hip hop out the water so much that they were going to start cheating for everybody to eat. So you had an artist and the only thing they had to do when it was with the machine is show up, show up for the interview, show up for the photo session, show up for the studio, show up for the video. Now that's being taken away because all these people been using all these artists. And at the end of the day, the artists end up broke. Or now you have different Spotify and stuff or Apple or different ones, right? The strings. Who is making the count or policing the strings? So how you know they're not saying, I got five strings and you got one? Right. Or however it may be. Nobody has no way of knowing that. So now the artist can't have that machine to be certified cash anymore for making money. So they all going crazy. So now everybody's telling on everybody. Everybody's drinking more. Everybody's doing more powder. Everybody's doing those little sick little moves of, of you know, the guys waking up with their butt sore. You know, that type of shit. Mm-hmm. Or the mm-hmm. girls waking up and they don't know where they're at. So everybody's stressed the fuck out. Because the machine is over. So now they just need to rebuild and put decent people in the industry. How, to have the machine back. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, obviously, with what you're saying, it's very important because you had a business model that is costing them money. You're spending less money. You're making more profit. You're making them look bad, and they're supposed to be the executives, the professionals, and you're the amateur building up a company on your own without a background. You didn't go to school to learn how to be an executive, and you're building a business doing $750 million. Here's here's a question for you. In, In the financial industry, you'll hear many times they'll say, you know, these companies are part of the too big to fail. For example, we can't let AIG go out of business. We can't let Bank of America go out of business. We can't let these guys go out of business. Is Biggie part of the too big to fail, or are there people way above Diddy that are part of the too big, too big to fail that they'll always be protected, specifically when you say higher-ups? Well, you got to look at it like this. Puppy is one of those black guys is probably more fear of, the, of white America in black America. We feel in black America, we pass all that. They can't get to him. In white America, you got to show them some respect. Are they going to spank him on his ass? Especially now, because when you really look at it, Chirac was a great company that gave Puffy opportunity. I think he was what he gave mm-hmm. $1,000 to get in. Mm-hmm. And then he was able to make all this money. And then he wanted more and more and more. And the first time, didn't allow him to throw a tantrum. He hit him with the stuff that people hit him with, probably. So he told him, say, hey, you racist. You motherfuckers is racist. And they say, yeah. You know, I ought to say that I was raised in Compton. And I was made in Vegas at UNLV. Mm. UNLV taught me the opportunity to be around people that was business mind, that was loyal, that was happy. And that's where my lessons came from. So I understand business better than most people. That's why I never been in no damn videos. So at the end of the day, when Puffy went at the alcohol business, I used to play football with John Kennedy Jr. almost every weekend, one of the best guys I ever met and hung out with. We used to play football. But that being said, he come from a bootlegger family. Most of the big guys come from a bootlegger family. You know, the alcohol mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. legal. These guys is smart enough 
to be humble, but why does it have to be aggressive, tough? So when Puffy challenged him, and they knew Puffy lived in the glass house, his house came tumbling down because those rocks was coming through that glass house. On the simple fact, when he called those guys racist, and he they knew he had those secret, those um, hidden secrets, they ain't just found out that the things Puffy was doing. They ain't just found out mm -hmm. how the industry is. They haven't just found out how they, you know, they pick and choose. They, they're part of the government. And I say that because that's why it was so easy to snatch motherfucking Puffy down. And all the people that Puffy fuck with, they can't say nothing because they're part of it too. If they go after Puffy, and rumor has it, Jaguar, right, all these other names of Leroy, Little Roy, all these guys, Little hey, Rod, no. Little Rod, there's cameras in the, every single room, and he's yep. recorded, and now he's got all these footage. Think about if he's got footage of all this talent where these big, too big to fail companies that are relying on these talent to keep producing. What happens if Diddy threatens them and says, if you do anything to me no. and I release me, this to yeah. the world, you're going to lose billions of dollars? No. No, 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 no. You guys are being fooled. The best talent we have in the industry right now is some of the talent you guys never heard. There's a lot of guys all around the world. It's the world's best kept secret when it comes to music. People are starting to use their friends or artists who play those games. You know, basically, they on the level because they did everything that these people wanted them to do. They sold, they sold. And I, we all joke about it, but they always had a conversation about it, and I always say the same thing. I always say, well, you had Illuminati, and then they have the Masons. The Masons believe in God. The Illuminati believe in the devil. The Illuminati in Germany, Russia, whatever, they believe on men on men. They don't mean they part of the gay community. They mean they just overpower each other. And it might sound crazy, but at the end of the day, that's why it's no great talent. There's a lot of great talent out there, but some, some of the best talent is not having the opportunity to get in the door because the people with the secret society is messing around with each other and messing with people's heads. And then when you, like I said, a person like myself, I'm the only guy in this business, or especially a black guy. You see why I started my company. From either a check from Solar, or epic, or priority. These are real companies. A Time Warner, or Interscope, right? That publishing money, different stuff. That's how I started my company. Then you can have Rapidlot do a whole book. Lord J. Prince will do a book, and this be his word. I started my company with drug money. If it's money, they can say that. If it's cash money, they can say that. So they say. If it's, what's the other dude, he ain't that popular, uh, No Limit. No Limit can let it be known every penny he got came from drug money. And the list can go on ruthless. Puffy. Mm -hmm. Bad Bible story with the drug money, and they even missed it. And Obama gets his, his supply and his crime out as a favor. So look at this. All these people say that's how they started it, and that's how they built it. But I'm the one they take through the rear. And I didn't start my company with certain way. That program started with what I just said. Even when they came after me, they committed fraud, bankruptcy fraud, RICO, everything you can think of. But since it was a machine that would get artists before anyone else, they had to get me out the way. Not only would I get an artist from anyone else, I can take your artist and make them a star a superstar that you couldn't do. A lot of guys get artists and bring their career down. I got the art, got the artists and made their career the best. Same way I did with Tupac. And Tupac stood for a smart young man, a gifted young man, and wanted to save the world. Eventually, he cost him his life. Eventually, you have guys who will speak about Tupac who never met him. They said it was with death row. Now we're there. Or they might have been security for death row or the car washing death row. 
They never met Pac. And they would say they want some negative things with Tupac, about Tupac. They have to tell Tupac stories. It's all designed to make these people feel they the ones who's working for the industry who keep having the same old talent. A lot of people doing the same old songs, same old ass artists. It's like warm soup all over again. These opportunities to these younger generations who really are the best, who got the guy get talent. That's what we're missing in the industry. And fire all those old heads part of secret society. You got executives making more money than any artist or any label right now. You got Taylor Swift is popular, mm -hmm. way popular. Mm -hmm. But you have a, a, a artist or an executive at Interscope or Universal or any of these places, right? Why do they get more security than Taylor Swift? She on tour busting her ass, and they making just as much money as Taylor Swift and got more security than Taylor Swift. That seems like something wrong with that picture. But what point are you trying to make here when you're talking about the the uh, Freemason and Illuminati? One is driven by love. The other one is driven by, you know, God, and the other one is driven by the devil. What, what do you mean when you're saying these guys are selling their souls? What does well, that selling your souls mean? Because... Because most of the time when they go to these, these meetings in the, at the major energy at these, at these companies, they joke and talk about these type of things. In regards they believe it or not, it's always a joke. It sounds like you're, you're somewhat defending Diddy a little bit and protecting him and putting more of the onus on some of the guys no, at the top. This, it's, but if it's, I, may, I, I okay. just want to ask one question. No, I want to ask one no, question. If, if you were to... I'm, if, I'm just going to correct you right there. Go it's, for it. I'm gonna, let, let me answer that question that you said. Listen. Go ahead. There's no puzzle. Me and Puffy, not friends, never will be friends. Okay. And they I ain't scared of him. I ain't scared of nobody but God. It's not about I'm protecting him. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not going to... I know a lot of stuff is true that he been got caught doing, but I'm not going to tell you something I was in the room. Got if it. I was in the room with that motherfucker, you shouldn't be talking to me because if you was in the room with Diddy... I wouldn't be talking to you. If he was in there and he was telling you, take that, take that, take that, take that. You think me, you go be conversating? I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> At the end of the day, you know, I believe in what I believe in. <laughs> Once well, said twice, don't say it at all, you know. <laughs> but whatever you want to ask me, I'm going to let you finish asking the question because I'm here because. I love the fact what you guys are doing because it's a way that we can communicate and not only just build uh, hip-hop, we can build the, the, the world, the United States. I can't even go to the next country. I can only go so in my backyard, and I'm a part of this. And, you know? and, and, and Shook, I appreciate that. Shook, for, for somebody that's the, the hip-hop world today, to be able to do what a lot of these executives did that taught somebody like Diddy, is that even possible today? Meaning, did social media fully eliminate that business model where the next generation of young talent are now protected? No, it's, nobody's protected yet. But that's okay, we're going to talk about Puff. All right, listen to this. There was a guy named Barry Gordy, and you know who Barry Gordy is. Mm -hmm. Now, I went in the room with Barry Gordy, but everybody knew that Barry Gordy hits both sides of the fence, they always say. So Barry Gordy was the guy who had the Jackson 5, who eventually kind of Michael Jackson because Joe Jackson was a jail witness, and they say, Michael, you come hang with us, you can get toys. They might got Michael some more than toys. Then there was Courtney Jones wow. with Michael. And you know exactly where I'm going with this. Next thing you know, Michael Jackson Allegedly, they said he stopped partying with younger boys. So where did Michael Jackson get it from? Hmm. And if you know, you wouldn't have a problem to say, you wouldn't have a problem to say, Barry, Barry wow. Gordy was touching on Michael Jackson. You wouldn't have a problem to say that Quincy Jones was touching on Michael Jackson. And you wouldn't have a problem to say that Michael Jackson was touching on the little boys. But with the problem come in at, and we start talking about the Clyde Davisons and the other people, and it goes down to Puffy. That's where the buck stops at. See, Puffy's a black-ass, sacrificed lamb. 
they, they, Puffy, Puffy does me, I think, to them. Shit, they ain't tripping. But if you don't stop the cycle, it's going to keep happening. Somebody needs to go visit Usher right now. Say, Usher, it's not too late for you. We you know you hit a few other guys you brought on, but it's not too late for them either. But at some point, you got to stop the head or it's going to keep creating going down. The shit goes down. But you guys don't want to fix that. Right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's when you're breaking, I mean, you're going all the way back to, you, if you know. Actually, okay. Now I'm going, okay. But because it's the facts, but this is the thing, right? It's right now. We're talking about the industry. When, when, when I was in business, a guy in the projects is saying word and say that he have a brother or somebody have a son that can rap or sing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to drive my ass to the projects and sit on, and sit on that mid quake and get that art inside and make a hit out of it, right? But now what I'm basically saying is they got it so blocked in or locked, they're not giving some of the best talented people the opportunity to be artists. Or they have to have an artist that's 50 years old, 49, still putting them on the front line. Give these younger generations the opportunity the chance to grow and make some of themselves. But if they can chill off the death row and replace me with the other guys, that's why the industry that way. The industry, as long as we, long as we make each other better by competing with each other, competition, the industry will be better. Now that you have all these guys and women clothes. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. But once again, I'm not about gay bashing because I don't I'm not homophobic. But what we say in the end is well, I, my belief is this. If you puffy and we friends, and if you mess with boys and girls that's your business, let me know because I might not want you to I'm not gonna want you to hit the blunt. Or drink out my glass, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But if you let me know, I said, shit, I'll give it to you when I finish. I'll give you the glass, when, uh, you know, you can have the last sip. Mm-hmm. We just have, people just have a problem because they don't want, they want to know what they're dealing with. And it's not fair to use power and money to make somebody do something they don't want to do. Yeah, there's a big difference That's between there's in. there's a big Whatever. difference between yeah. a person exactly. being gay and the young boys. That That's the problem. You know, and the young girls, like, you know, stuff that was going on with R. Kelly, um, um, you know, and and what he went through. There's a there's a lawyer that's saying what happened to R. Kelly is about to happen or did he hear soon? And it's just a matter of time before they get him and he goes away uh, uh, with what happens with them. But l- let me bring it back to what you were talking about. Let me bring it back to what you were talking about. You were talking about how there's a difference. They come they come after a guy like you. Instead of going after these guys, you're talking about uh, Barry Gordy or the Clive Davis or the Lucian Grange. I don't know if you even, you know, the name. Did you ever do anything with Lucian or no? Did you ever have any uh, uh, dealing, business dealing with Lucian? Yeah, okay. One of the things that would mean is, is be my concern is that I believe that we we'll always be knowing the problem. Now we got to start uh, working out and have a solution. And people are always going to talk. But I'm from old school where that's his best. And that's me talking about something to fix a lot of things, you know, because I think that I respect you guys' platform because there are a lot of platforms nowadays that it'd be people who's not business, never did any business, or never been part of the industry, and they get these platforms and they say the worst fucking things about people. And it's no big deal because I look at it like this. If somebody speak on me, I can respect that. But I can't respect that you weren't saying the thing before I came to prison. Because when I was on the street, I'm quite sure people was whispering, but it's nearly been nothing let me hear whisper. But it's stuff like I learned so much. Like when I first when I when I came to the county jail, I was allowed to have no phone calls, no in gun mail, no alcohol mail, no communication with nobody in the world. And if I wanted to hire an attorney, you had to get approved by county council, which says attorney for the sheriffs, the DA, and the judge. If they say I can't have this attorney, that means I can't have this attorney. And all my legal business was recorded. And it came to the point where I lost my mother 
my mother would always been my best friend, my rock. I was a mama's boy. And my mother used to try to come there and see me. And they would, she was to get 20 minute visit or 30 minute visit. They give her five minute visit. They go crazy on her to the point where they scared her so bad one time. She went from the county jail to the hospital. And she called and said, well, please let me talk to my son because they won't let me leave the hospital. I mean, you know, she couldn't leave. She was hospitalized. They told my mother no. And she said, the only thing she wanted to do is talk to her son. My mother died. When my mother died, I wasn't allowed to still use the phone. I wasn't allowed to get a bill and go to my mother's funeral. I wasn't allowed to make no arrangements or say goodbye to my mother or my family. I wasn't able to talk to no one. They gave me one little, quick little call to my family. And the crazy thing about all that, my family, I come from a big family. My mother had over almost a half a million people on her funeral. My mother was a well-respected good woman. I wasn't there. And they even, my mother been married. She was a knight since she was 18 years old. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. When I reported, they called her Maxine Chapman, her maiden name. You know, everything was all done wrong. And to the point where even the people, my mother was old school. My mother done a lot for me and my sisters. So when she said, whenever we die, what to worry about having a funeral. So my mother had her own lot where she was buried in and all the stuff. Now, there's been a lot of people pitched in and tried to send catering people or, or some money on a funeral. And you know what? The same people who sent the money on the funeral go and said, look what I did. Look what I did. Mm. He couldn't pay for his mother's funeral. His family is stupid. This, 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 right? The most stupidest thing in the world. And I never see the person's name and get upset. I said, damn. Maybe they need a little more uh, somebody's recognizing them than I do. <laughs> so, well, they're going to lie about it, right? But when you really look at it, everybody got a million things to say that's not the truth. But how many people can just really have a conversation? I can have a conversation with you right now. Mm -hmm. And whatever you want to ask me, you can ask me. And I'm going to answer to you. And it's going to be the truth. And I'm not doing it for no fucking fame. I don't get paid for it. It's a platform and it's to help people. Because right now, I'm all about getting my freedom back and be the best man I could be for my family and myself. Then my, I'm going to say my community, because my community is the whole West Coast and anywhere else there, I feel like I'm going to be here for that. But the society, I owe a lot. I'm planning on paying my debt to it and not in this motherfucker. Whatever you need to ask me, I'm going to tell you the truth. Well, respect to you and your mother. May God bless her soul. Uh, I'm looking at her picture right now online when you were talking about it. I'm just pulling up the story uh, with the story. She was 77 years old when she went through it, and this was, what, six years ago, something like that. It's, it'll be six years in two months, June 18th. Um, but, but Shook, you know, going, going back to you saying my loyalty West Coast, right, with, you know, what, what you want to give back to the folks on West Coast, a lot of this stuff started off with East Coast, West Coast, right? And I'm a kid that grew up in L.A. I went to Glendale no. High School. I'm a I'm a Glendale High School kid. I no, was. No, I don't. Okay, this is the difference. I wouldn't say it started off as East Coast, West Coast. Yeah, we was competitive against each other and everywhere else. But rhyming started on the East Coast. They was rhyming like a motherfucker. You know, they was, you know. The shirt green, your hat red, whatever. You know, they were rhyming and they was good at it. We became the storytellers of stuff. And then about the time I got in the, in, in, in the business, on the West Coast business, well, I got in it before, but by the time I made my mark, it was about doing something representing the West Coast because you had the people who represent New York, you had the people who represent down south. You know, later on the Midwest came, but at the same time, we didn't have no power player representing the West Coast. So my goal was to do a label on the West Coast and bring the West Coast together because we were divided. You had red, you had blue, and, you know, you had, you had the message which represented brown, you know, then you had the bay. Mm -hmm. So my thing was if we make it the West Coast, 
where it's fun for everyone. It's everybody having fun, everybody enjoying themselves, everybody getting real game. So we give you some stuff that you can hear on these records or these CDs or cassettes in your car. It can teach you something. So that meant something to me because I was born and raised out here. So therefore, I built the West Coast sound. I say that's their fro. And then we was already there. And it was, it was it was because of the fact that my background is sports. I've been playing little league baseball, football, basketball, play basketball at Lewis Park, play baseball at Kelly Park, which is the crypt neighborhood. I still went to practice, still went to the games. And you know, I went to high school and college and all that stuff, right? But at the same time, when I first got ready to do the crank, I treated like everybody on death row was treated like it was a football team. People ate together. They partied together. They argued together. They fought against each other. They fought together. But we built something with the West Coast sound. And that West Coast sound made it like almost like a peace tree for the West Coast. Now, you got people from different neighborhoods who are actually instead of hating each other, He's having each other back, doing great business with each other. I got them going to the children's hospitals, giving out toys and, and playing with the, the patients in there. I got them going to different elementary schools and junior high schools and high schools, giving away, you know, uh, toys for Christmas and uh, all this type of stuff. I, at the same time, I probably gave away more turkeys than pretty much a lot of people. And on top of that, every Mother's Day, I should give a single Mother's Day dinner for all the single mothers for free at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm. And they would get their baskets, they would get their roses, they would get their, you know, their stuff. I have a, a, a older guy who performed, like the Isis Brothers. And I have a, a Tupac say, Dear Mama. I have Joe. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Camera perform. I did all these things because I wanted to make it a better place where I was living at. And I'm born and raised and live on the West Coast. So I know if we can pull everybody together as, as, for his music to get along, we can make a big difference. But sometimes when you're doing too much right, that people stop the people from getting in trouble, that means the police are going to make less money. Because now they, they can't get their overtime. So I didn't get it rewarded for the good things I did. I got punished for the good things I did. How much of the, how much of the things that you did show? Only where we going to... From from your standpoint, how much do you look back? As, because I just had Dame Dash on two weeks ago, and I had Dame on, and we were talking about Rockefeller, Rockefeller, you know what they did, the the business he built with Jay Z, and then you're on the West Coast, and then you got Diddy, and he's doing what he's doing with Biggie, you know what what was the cause of the fall of Death Row Records? You operating Death Row Records, you had a lot of bi- players that ended up being big. Okay. What was the falling out? Yes, it, okay. The difference is this. Death Row Records was a real company. Most of these other labels had logo deals. They didn't own it. When I start telling people I own my masters, they were telling me, I, I ain't a slave, I don't have no masters. They didn't know that. They didn't understand the meaning that the music you make is called masters and I own mine. So if they took down Death Jam, or if they took down a Rockefeller to make the Death Jam, if they took down Death Jam, they're not taking down a black man like Russell Simmons, who also was raping all the little dudes, they take it down a person. Russell Simmons always had a partner. And his partner always, it's not about being racist, but Russell wanted to play the so race car when it was convenient. Russell Simmons' first partner was Rick Rubin, was a white guy. Then it was New York. You know? So, Death Row was the only legal. You said Lior, like Lior Cohen? Cow house. You're talking about Lior Cohen? Yeah, Lior Cohen. Got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I was the only powerhouse who didn't start my business or my company with drug money. And on top of that, I'm not saying that's wrong or right. This is the facts. But even the people you name, I bet you, you name all these guys, they've been caught dealing drugs or their business. If they can't, if they, if they attack them, they they really attacking Universal or Sony or Time Warner, right? If you attack Jeff Rowe, you just come for Jeff Rowe. Because like I said before, I didn't have a relationship with anybody doing the legal with my company. But at the same time, we know who did mess with these people. Because uh, 
Michael Harris at the time, man, who everybody said was a, a, for a fact he had 137, 137 for the government, right? But they allowed him to lie and commit fraud and say he had something to do with death row. But I'm not the one he was fucking with. He up there, when, when Drake is a star, he hangs with them, not me. When D. Griffey sued me and said, give him $10 million because I signed some of him to be a part of death row before it was death row. It wasn't me. Guess who signed that paperwork? Mm. Andre and Doc. Guess how much money they had to pay? Mm. Zero. Because they protected because they belong to Innocent. It's like they didn't find, well, that's neither here nor there. But at the end of the day, at the, at the end of the day, it's like this. The guys who start their business with drugs, they don't really own their business. So they don't sweat them. Or they work for the government. And I don't. I don't work for the government, and I'm not a drug dealer. It's not that I'm so smart that they can catch me. I'm just too smart to be stupid. Yeah. I'm making great money with a money machine. Why do I want to do something illegal? Yeah, I, sense? I even read somewhere where you where said I it. Come from, if you slow, you get taken advantage of. Yeah. yeah, and you don't you don't work hard to get out the ghetto and be legal. To once you get out the ghetto and become legal. You're going to do what, steal cars, steal radio, steal drugs, some stupid point. It makes no sense. Yeah, I... I, I but at uh, the end of the day, it all comes down to the same thing. But now here's the it's thing, the people, though. If, if we bring you know, it down to you... We bring it down to you, Shug, with the chaos that happened within Death Row, right? Think about what happened with Easy E. And I saw when you were on Jimmy Kimmel, when you said that we did the Easy E thing. You know, when you put your feet up, we saw that. I'm like, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, hey, look, I'm going to tell you a real story. I'm going to tell you a real story. Listen to this. I never told nobody straight on air this story. You got to remember one thing. In prison, I, I'm in the cell by myself. Besides this AI thing I got, and we talk to each other. So I'm probably, uh, you know, ain't used to talking that much. So I'm going a little too fast. Okay. For you. So let me throw it down All good. And, take this, and take this last story. Okay, so this thing is this. Out of guys with the NWA, Eric was my favorite. Because Eric was the only guy from Compton that really was from Compton. Mm -hmm. So as we start trying to get this, uh, uh, I wanted to make Death Row and Lucas together. And Eric was down for it, but then he didn't want to leave Jerry. So when it came to getting Eric to sign the lease, I had respect for him. So what I ended up doing, I had... Dre on a, on a piece of paper on the contract, Mr. Lay on the contract, and Doc on the contract by himself. And I had another piece of paper with above the law, cocaine, country to a producer, Bobo Canone, you know, the, all the artists, right? Mm -hmm. And they all wanted me to, to come with me. So I said, look, I'm going to give Eric and we're going to work it out. If we can't be together, I'm going to take the ones I'm going to take and keep the other ones. And at the same time, would happen. Andre wanted Easy dead, right? And not only I wouldn't speak like this, but he's not really a civilian. He, you know, he's not part of the game, he's a civilian. So when it came down to it, I just thought he was joking. I said, nah, I said, look, man, I'm, I'm going to be busy with my, you know, I know he, I said, but I'm going to have him come to the studio, which was Galaxy Studio, and the sort of building. And I told the guard, well, look, when Eric get here, just call and let me know. So I said, I'm going to call him up here. And Dre said, no, just be quiet. I'm going to call him until he's in the media. Don't let him know you did. So he called the easy. He was like, he's talking to him. He said, man, I want you uh, to get on my album. He was working on the car. And we can maybe put it out on Wookie. He's like, for real? He said, yeah. So ain't no way at the studio right now. I got a song I want you to hop on. I met the, uh, he, said, he was like, you know what? Uh, um, Solo our studio at. He said, I went up there with shit. He said, Yeah. And he said, He up there. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. When the guard, when the guard get there, they let him know, you tell him to see me, he'll let you up. So, bam, I'm at the studio. Dre is not at the studio. So, when Eric finally get there, the guard calls up. He says, Well, um, Easy up here for Dre. Let him up. 
in the act of God. You know what's up there? It's a test tray. So he walks in, he walks in the studio, you see me, you see a few people, we start talking. I said, man, he ain't coming, but I'm going to talk to you about it. I show him the pictures of all the artists I had on one piece and the three I had on another piece. I was like, Trey can get out because you messed up with the contract. Doc can get out and say that he can get out on training to him. I said, Doc don't have no motherfucking voice. You can't sell Donald Duck. Ain't nobody gonna buy that. So he's like, yeah, you're right. And I said, now, Christian Lee and, 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 and Andre, they're together. So he decided that he wanted to think about it. And I said, I ain't coming at you. All the other type of shit. I said, but the boy, he wants something to happen to you bad. Right? He said, nah, Andre never did that to me. I don't want to take care of me. Bought him this and bought him that and put him on, basically. So I right, hold up. So I'll say that. I call. So when I answer the phone, I'm talking to him. I said, you get ready to come up here now. What you want done again? He was like, man, shoot that motherfucker in the head, blow his head off, shoot him in the eye, take pictures of it. You don't got one of those things, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. You put a phone shit, you know. Get one of those portable cameras and let me see it. I want to see it, you know, blah, blah, blah. When I hung up that phone, I seen one of the saddest things I ever seen in a man. I'm looking at Easy, Eric, like, he said, I bought a car. I did all this for him. He went to me, he didn't do nothing. And it's like he's trying to uh, hold back the tears because he don't want to be embarrassed by me seeing him cry. Because he, he crying because he's scared or he crying because he hurt. But for another man, and, you know, crying in front of another man is never a good look. Unless you get, you know, hear a verse or hear a scope or one of those places. But, uh, as to, you know, but back to the story, he looking, he looking so sad. And one tear started coming down a little bit. Then a few tears started coming down. I said, check this out, Eric. I ain't gonna never do that to you. You don't like a trip. I said, you don't got sign these all this. This one right here is for all of them. This one for the one I told you. I'll give you a me and you always get straight. We hung out together. We did all kind of shit together, you know? He said, nah, man. Uh, I'm going to get Dre. I said, nah, don't do nothing to him. He said, why? I said, it's something called a chronic. It's almost done. Get ready to come out. So he signed it. I wanted to make sure it was him. I got his ID. Make sure it's right. Send it to the top of his driver's license. And send, and, you know, releases. And uh so Virgil Roberts and Dick Griffey, they didn't believe it. So, so, that so, alone, so in this story, you're saying Dre, Dre backstabbed uh, Eric? Yeah, that was the same. So, so how, how about the, the, I read somewhere in a story where Dre owned 50% of Death Row Records and he didn't get any royalty and it was supposed to be 60 million. When they asked him, how did he feel about it? Was he upset? He said, you can't put a price tag on a peaceful state of mind. What, what happened there with you and Dre? Well, first of all, this is a real true story. And Dre got way more money than he was a guy, number one. He didn't put no money up to start the company. I'm also Dre manager for the rest of Dre's life. So let's start with that first. Because I got Dre a publishing deal. First of all, I had to go through a whole lot to get him out that contract. And Dre would still be on a contract with Lucas if he wanted to leave. He couldn't be doing no this with nobody. On the chronic, Dre did maybe three four songs on there. Doggy Style, Zero. Dre didn't do California Love at all, a thousand percent. He didn't write it, and he didn't produce it, and he didn't build Roger on there to do it. But Dre's an incredible guy to help mix and fix the shit. He's a great DJ, he got a good ear. Or to get a sample and make that sample. Like, G thing is nothing but a sample on across the board. We just have people come be prayed. But it's not like he thought of it, it came so new. And Dre did not write lyrics. Now, do you really think Dr. Dre, if you want to call him, Andre Young, the bitch beater, going to come up to Mr. Knight and tell me what to do? True story. Dre came to me because. 
I'm not gonna go into the situation with him it's on about his, his sex practice. I said, well, something like that. It's like old Hollywood, you gotta get married quickly. He wanted to marry this person, that person didn't want to, I didn't get the new person he married then. One day, Drake came to me and said, I'm never gonna cuss on Adams again. I'm never gonna talk about women again. And he told me that he wanted to be white. And this is a serious question. And I thought he was joking, so I started laughing, right? I said, be white. I said, man, and I still think he's joking. I said, I, I ain't God. I can't make you white. All the best I can do is teach you how to live like you're white. He said, well, I'm ready. <laughs> so that's why he ended up marrying the white girl, right? That's why he ended up having, you know, the rich kids. He, he was thanked me for it. It wasn't being funny or nothing. It was just a fact. If you represent somebody, you're supposed to do anything you can to make their dream come true. And that's like if you get a star on a walk of fame, none of the black kids are going to come. Only the ones who he consider white kids. That's a fair, but that's not nothing wrong with that. That's what we and that's how he thinks. Dre got $2 million when we got him off death row. The real reason why we got him off death row is called Tupac. Tupac was mad because when he found out that Dre didn't do California now, Tupac was mad because we needed Dre to get on the stand at Snoop's murder trial. You can ask David Kennedy that for he can be a character record for him. I couldn't do it, so they needed Dre. Dre said, buddy, you better counsel that. I ain't never going to take help Snoop. Snoop go get life, he get life. So Pac got mad, so we need to kick him off. That's how that happened. Everybody knows that. Ask the lawyer. That's simple. The first album, Dre B, the first one he said we're going to curse, was called Aftermath, and it drops. But it's not neither here or there. It's not about talking bad about Drake or anybody else or putting these people down because you know what? We all did great things for each other. Every person who participated on Death Row did great things. Pac just took it to another level once I got Pac out. Pac had more, uh, if you, like, Snoop would talk to the people on some gang and shit or some, oh, uh, this whatever type of stuff. Pac would talk to the people about, you know, uh, getting back to the community, uh, getting breakfast in the morning, getting people with their books, you know. We was talking about, like, starting a big brother program and the big sister program back. And this before there was we, people was being recognized for bully, getting bullied. We was talking about having people getting bullied who scared to go to school. So that's what the movement was. So all this negative, anybody, it's just anybody can talk bad. And I always say that if you say some bad news about somebody, it'll make it around the world ten times. If you say so good about somebody, mm. it barely make it down the road. That's true. It's real true. But, like I said, uh-huh. it's your show. I enjoy talking to you. So whatever you want to ask me, ask me. I'm here for you. Sure, I'll make this the last this last, last topic here before we wrap up and finish off. So I'm a class of 96 kid. Okay. I'm, in, I'm in L.A. Uh, I'm a Tupac guy. That was my guy. I, I came to the States in 1990. So I was all West Coast hip hop. That was my world. Later on, I end up interviewing Greg Kading. Greg Kading, I don't know if you remember him. He's the LAPD detective when he was included in the murder for Tupac. In his book, he writes about Keith Davis, member of the Crip Street, Street Gang, gave a confession years along saying he rode in the car, used in L.A., shooting for Tupac, et cetera, et cetera. Where I'm going with this is Kading also said he named uh, Sean Combs as having been involved in the conspiracy, also wrote that a bounty was offered for Suge Knight's murder. murder. This is you. And then later on, Kading alleged that Knight hired Wardell Pucci Fouse, uh, Faust to kill Biggie, Sean Combs' most valuable star, whose murder was done following a party at a Peterson Automotive. You know, that big party guys were all there. And then Pucci later survived a murder attempt. But the point here is with the Biggie story, I, I, I followed the Tupac story closely. Do you for a fact know who killed Biggie? Well, one, you know, I could know who killed Biggie, I just don't know. The thing about this, it is what it, it is was a real sad day, not just for Biggie, but for you know, his family, but for the culture of hip hop. I think that destroyed hip hop. 
with those two murders. And unfortunately, I was incarcerated. I was in the county jail. And I don't know who was having a party, where they was having a party, or who party was. And But like I said, I don't like to speculate, so I'm not going to ask a guess that I just don't know. And at the same time, it's a rival. But shit, the only thing I can say is a sad situation, and there's been a lot of uh, different people they say was involved in that. But how would they know where Biggie at to do something to him? I don't think no one person can just say, oh, I'm going to do this and get away with it. That sounds real crazy. But who knows? But I know one good thing about it. One day the truth will come out. And the great thing about it, neither one of the murders had anything to do with me. One of the murders, I got a bullet that itched in my skull. And I lost millions and millions of dollars and eventually my freedom and my, my company. But I didn't say I don't want to have two prior kids. Then it came to the biggest story. When it came to the biggest situation, now I was out in the county jail. But after that happened, it was me from the county jail. But maybe, maybe let me ask another question. What do you think about the speculation, the fact that Diddy had some ties to what happened to Biggie? Do you have any, anything to speculate there or, or not at all? Well, the thing about that, I also heard that. I also heard everybody say, and I think it was a guy, I didn't hear a person who was saving all over the internet. His bodyguard said that he had something to do with it. And I never, like I said, me and Puppy is nowhere near friends. The respect for him was not a long time ago. But at the same time, it's a bad man. It's, I don't feel, I don't give a fuck if it's me, him, you. Anytime you think you can play God and take somebody's life, that's a fucked up thing. I might be a lot of shit. One, it ain't smart being stupid, so I'm not stupid. Two, I don't got that type of nuts. You want to see another man lose his life and see the history. You know, when you go to funerals and you see what the mother go through, the family go through, I don't want to see no one go through that. So it would be crazy if somebody knew it's just a fucked up thing. And I can't say Puffy did it and Puffy didn't do it. I can't say the crooked cops did this and the crooked cops didn't do it. But what I could say a thousand percent, I didn't have to do nothing to shit. And I'm not saying to clear my name and all that shit because my name was already what it is. And the best person I want to understand me is God. And if you want people to love me, to I love them. Yeah. But at the same time, when you look at it, man, it's just, it's a situation where I think it, it must hip hop up. It makes the culture of the people up. It kept the thing. And when I lost Tupac, it was a long time before I really listened to a lot of pop music. I got thought about it and think about him all the time. I still do today. And sometimes when I hear somebody say negative things about pop, I get more mad when they say negative things about pop before they say negative things about me. Because I'm here. You got something to say about me, and I'm going to bless you. You know, but be a man. Tell your life. Tell your story. We still will never be the same without Tupac and Biggie. And I'm an engineer because I, was, I knew Pac and Biggie loved each other. When I was in the hotel, and me and Pac in the hotel, and he talking to Biggie before Pac passed away, he wasn't mad at Biggie like, I hate this motherfucker. He was more hurt because he felt that Biggie had something to do with the, the shit in the studio in New York. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they was talking, I could tell it was two men that cared about each other. And you know what I mean? I'm thinking about making history again. I'm like, man, y'all see, it seems like y'all love each other with me, hating love relationship. I said, the best way to end all this is do a four CD disc on death row. A song with Biggie doing CD, Pac doing CD, and the other two, both of them going back and forth. They took in, in Pac, you know, let us say what they say. And, but uh, yeah, that would have been the most incredible thing in the world. 
only person, nobody gained them uh, too properly, even and did you mean only some jealous, nothing, weird motherfuckers? Everybody else can still take that loss today. Yeah, that was uh, uh obviously. Yeah, if, Big, hey, if Biggie wouldn't have, if Biggie wouldn't have passed away, Coffee would have never been a rapper. So he gained out the situation. I'm not saying he had something to do with it, but he gained out the situation. I lost. I lost my freedom behind Tupac dying. I lost business. I lost lost house, the whole lot of shit. I lost my freedom. Ninety five percent of the reason why I got sent to the to the penitentiary is behind the Tupac shit. Even on this case. They brought it up in this case and where it wrote me. But I really appreciate your time and I will say this no matter what. Nobody would be more happy to see all this truth come to me in and the truth come out and we can move on and we can all hear. It's been a long time for Pac. It's been a long time for me. And somebody knows something. <laughs> sure. Back in the 15, not 15 years ago, it's got to be a while back. Uh, you, a couple times I met you. One time it was through a friend named Jay King. And the other time was uh, on a flight from Burbank to Vegas. You were sitting right next to me and I was... But that was, we're talking years and years this ago. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I just want to say thanks for making the time to jump on here and have this conversation. Appreciate you, and hopefully we'll do it again sometime in the future. Well, I'm going to say this. I appreciate you. You're the best. Enjoy your show. And I'm doing my own little collect call, collect call, you know. And I finally got my Twitter back. I know you're good friends with everybody. <laughs> so you let uh, Elon Musk know that these guys had jacked my Twitter, my official Twitter, and was putting all kind of negative stuff about all these people and then tried to distort me to get it back and then keep steady trying to harass me about it. So as most people say, as my mother would say, praise the Lord, I got my Twitter back. <laughs> and then, thank you. <laughs> Anytime, brother. Thanks, Shook. All right, buddy. Take, take care. Bye-bye. 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 I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party. Tulsi Gabbard says she is no longer a Democrat. A potential Tulsi Gabbard VP. Where we are being told that we just have to comply and go along with whatever they say. American people uh, are smarter than this. However, we must remain vigilant to recognize their propaganda for what it is, pure lie. Unfortunately, we live in a time where free speech is under attack. Whatever they say goes, and we, we have to just follow. And the people who suffered under your reign as prosecutor, you owe them an apology. Taking on Kamala Harris on a debate stage before, I would look forward to doing that again.